Hello and welcome to the Promised Land, a show about Manchester United and part of the 90 Min Podcast Network. And yet again, we feel like Manchester United is as far away from the Promised Land as they might have ever been. <laughs> Nil three at home to Bournemouth, Bayern Munich at Old Trafford and Liverpool at Anfield on the horizon this week. The, the meltdown is in full flow. Eric Ten Hag is two matches, one match away from being sacked again. How many times have we been here before? Rob, uh, you know, it's getting... It's, United are always one game away from a crisis, aren't they? Mm, they, they, yeah. they beat Chelsea the other day. Um, but there were a lot of things in that Chelsea game that United were doing that against a better team. And like Chelsea spent a billion quid, but against a better team, they would have really given up some really soft goals in that game. And it turns out Bournemouth were um, just uh, quite savvy to it, you know? Yeah, funny that Bournemouth worked that out, isn't it? So, you know, before the game, uh, we spoke, didn't we, Scott? And I said how worried I was about the match. And again, people I did speak to about it were like, but you just beat Chelsea. And I'm like, yeah, but did you watch the game? Because there were bits in that Chelsea game that, again, were alarming that we see all the time, isn't it? And I get that a lot of people want to put this on Ten Hag. We like to talk about the players more, don't we, individually and with their own performances. But Scott, any team that comes to Old Trafford and is organised and understands that Manchester United give you all the room in the world on transition through the midfield, if they've got anything up here and anything in there, they'll exploit it. And that's what Bournemouth did. Let's be honest, Scott. The score was four in the end, really. And actually, Bournemouth had another one earlier on that was offside. So it could have been five, could have been six on the day. Um, I described it as embar embarrassing, Scott, because that's kind of how I felt at the game. Angry and embarrassed that these players continually put in these performances. And it's difficult, isn't it? Because it's the same culprits to me. It's the same things that we're seeing over and over again. And I think Ten Hag, as an adult in the room, is trying to empower these adults and saying, I'm I'm going to put my trust in you to do this. And guess what, Scott? They constantly don't repay that, that trust from the manager. There's probably a section of people that are shouting at you, Rob, listening to this. Always. Blame the manager. You need to blame the manager and all of this. Um, mm. To me, I, I completely agree with you, but I think... How long have we been talking about that? How you know? How many times have we seen that these players continue to do? Mm. Bruno Fernandez on his own touchline in the fourth minute decides to just pick a pass into the middle, floats it in, ripe for the picking for a, a counter press. Bournemouth take it and they score from it directly, and then it's what are you guys doing? You know, throw, I'm going to throw my arms up and shout at you all now. To me, I'm looking at the, the team and I see that I think they're a lot more adventurous with the ball mm -hmm. uh, than than they were last season, at least. Yeah. And that they there's certain points of this season where we've been criticizing or people have been criticizing Eric Ten Hag's style of football for being too pragmatic. I think he was doing that on purpose. I said it at the time, he was doing it on purpose because Definitely. this is the alternative. Yeah. That what you're seeing, this is why he's pragmatic. Because mm -hmm. these players are brainless. And to me, I say these players. I mean, you look at the, the way he's setting up his midfield. You've got Amrabat and McTominay and then Bruno Fernandes. And McTominay is, a, is essentially a passenger in possession, scores goals, has a good smell, as Ten Hag puts it, for scoring goals in the box. Bruno Fernandes, Hollywood pass man, you know, mm -hmm. and th th it just doesn't work as a dynamic. And as much as, uh, you know, as much as we can blame the players, Rob, like, that, to me, the weekend was like, Eric, you got to change something. How many times have we seen this? You can't keep doing it. And in this week of all weeks, if you persist, I know you can't persist with Bruno Anfield because he got booked on purpose, maybe befitting of a, a Man United captain in this day and age, I suppose. Um, but, you know, I think the managers looking must be looking at it and thinking like, well, I hope he is anyway. I've, I've relied on these players enough. They've let me down too many times. I know he doesn't have loads of options. I know that Christian Eriksen, Casemiro, the, the two midfielders who were imperative to the, the season last season are injured currently. Yeah. yeah. Eriksen's the only one who really has any sense on the ball in midfield. Um, But you've got Corby in there. You've got other players who could potentially come in and play a little bit safer, a little bit smarter, but he doesn't change them. So 
where where do you stand, Rob? Where where are we? Well, well, when it goes wrong, it's easy for us to highlight stuff, and we will highlight that today. And I think it's fair to kind of to question Eric Ten Hag's methods and and his selections. That was certainly the story, like pre match beforehand when I saw the team sheet. You know, I did there was fear there, and I'll discuss some of that. But I think, Scott, we look at it this way, is that when you win a game, say like Chelsea, people then are okay with the decisions. Like you go, well, you did give this away to Chelsea and Chelsea nearly scored, but didn't or didn't didn't hurt you too badly. So it's okay. And that's true. Like winning cures everything, doesn't it? But it's not the bigger picture. And this is what we're seeing with Manchester United now. Was that the, the 12th loss of the season? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, 12th loss, I think in something like 26 games overall in that period of that run. 25th defeat in 80 games, which is quite a bad kind of ratio, isn't it? Almost like one in four losses or around that kind of amount over that period. I think, Scott, that Eric Ten Hag foolishly thinks that he has to manage these, these people like adults because he's giving them opportunities to fail. He's saying to these guys, well, look, guys, this is this is what we, we practice every week. This is what we do in training. So I need to see it on a football pitch so I can make decisions. And I think that's where he's run into a brick wall because this lot act like children. They act like children on a football pitch. You just highlighted there that the captain got himself deliberately booked with five minutes to go. And I I watched it right in front of me. 20 this, yards. Is, this is not confirmation. This is not I, confirmed. This but is opinion. I, it, it looked awfully like. <laughs> this is he's 20 yards in front of us, Scott. And we were watching him for five, 10 minutes. We're going, he's trying to get himself booked. And we were like, this is not good. He needs to keep his gob shut and he needs to walk away from referees and not get involved. The game is lost. So there's nothing here anymore. We don't need anyone to be a maverick. You don't need to go and score a goal. You've lost the game. Get ready for the next game where you're our captain. We need you at Anfield. And he talked his way into the book. And even when he got the yellow card, Scott, there was no reaction. He was just like, okay. I hate that. It's horrible. It's horrible. It's not something you'd ever accept from a Manchester United captain any time I've been a fan of my whole life. But anyway, I digress. Let's go back a little bit. I think when we saw the selection, it's the same tactic, Scott, isn't it? Like, it's not new. It's not like he's changing the tactics radically every week and the players are going, boss, we don't know 4-1-4-1, do we? But what you are seeing, Scott, is the same players make the same mistakes with slight tweaks in the team. Martial came into the team. Regulon came into the team. And as soon as Regulon was in, I was like, they're going to get run on that left that left side now. Like, you can see that that will be a problem. In the same way that Delo gets run at times on both sides. But I think when you've got two fullbacks doing that and getting caught either side, then you're, you're in a, a world of trouble. Again, I thought our best player on the day was Harry Maguire. And Maguire made mistakes on the day. But Maguire at least was trying to push the envelope and get the team moving. I don't know what he can do, Scott. Like you just mentioned, Manu. Yes, of course. You can, you can make this change of bringing Hannibal, get some energy back in there. You, you make some mounts to come back at some point. I'm sure he will play all these players because he does rotate those options in. But it's the people that supposedly have to start every week. Like mm. it is the captain. Like Scott McTominay has played himself into position of having to get picked because he's the only one who knows where the back of the net is half the time. So like, He's end up in the box, like as you said, you know, Eric Ten Hag said he can smell a goal. And that's the truth. That's why why you're picking Scott McTominay. Scott McTominay doesn't know where the ball is, though. He can't help you in on the deck at all, can he? So uh, it's a really hard one for Ten Hag. He's got options to change, Scott. But I think he's trying to trust them. That's what he's telling the squad. That's what you see. And they constantly make a fool of the manager. Yeah, uh, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and watch us on YouTube, the Promise and the Man United podcast. Like the video, subscribe, leave a comment for us as well. Pop the notification bell on so you never miss a show and follow us on social media at double underscore Scott Saunders, at underscore Rob underscore B and at TPLMUFC on X for the podcast itself. Um, you know, seen it all before. It's just... It's really difficult because, like, in the week like this now, Bayern Munich on Tuesday. We're recording this on Monday, by the way, just be, just to give it give the show a little bit more time to breathe before the Bayern game. I'll, I'll be going up to that, and I'm I'm not excited. I've got to say. Um, and then is Anfield on Sunday, and I know that. Well, I've been to Anfield before. I think every time I've been to Anfield, it's it's been a nil nil. I mean, 
imagine a nil nil <laughs> yes please imagine imagine this team keeping a clean sheet at anfield you just can't see it happening can you um but you know obviously rob the, the questions are now again and like i'm i know where you are i know where i am in this camp blame the manager get him out mm. he doesn't know what he's doing how do you respond to all of this I, I really think, Scott, if I was watching the team in a setup in an organisation that say he was radically changing the tactics every week and making players do things that they can't do, then absolutely I would be looking at that much more like succinctly and simple and saying, right, where is the problem? The problem is, though, Scott, is that they're doing tactics that they've been doing for a year. This lot have been practising this for a year and it's their real discipline that's causing these results. I don't know what Eric Ten Hag is supposed to do as a coach or any coach is supposed to do. I, I, again, I read on Twitter, people, again, this is the, the reaction, isn't it? The knee jerk is that you sack the manager. And I understand that's completely acceptable in modern football, that if things go wrong on the pitch, you sack the manager. It's kind of just, just the state of football. That's what happens. But it hasn't worked for Man United in 10 years to do that, has it? It's to... to do this, sack the manager and go again. And it hasn't worked for Man United in 10 years. And there's a lot of fans calling for it again. Oh, Zinedine Zidane. Oh, as we've said Do before. Do you think, honestly, that you'd see any, anything better than Zinedine, from Zinedine Zidane right now? Like, N Not at all. His Real Madrid team, I know they won the Champions League a few times, but he had some of the best players in modern football history. And they were very loose. <laughs> and, and I think <laughs> you know? that, may, that maybe fans don't pick up on the fact about how broken Man United are behind the scenes. like, And that's probably why we should also maybe just have a little word about Dan Ashworth and other things like that today later on in the show. Because it really does come, like, again, I heard people re writing going, oh, it's not about that. It's not about the glaze. It's not about stuff behind the scenes. You know, you've got to get the players to run. You have got to get the players to run, but please don't tell me he's not asking them. Please don't tell me he's not saying you're a professional footballer, mate, on £250,000 a week or whatever you are on. Why are you not doing that? We just mentioned the captain and I'm going to mention Bruno again. You know, if you let your team down and you let those fans down, you better get ready to get it in the neck. You better be ready for it because you deserve it. So this is the thing, leadership, we talk about that. I think that's been a, a theme that we've talked about, Scott, for two, three, four years, like a long time. And... I'm, I'm sure I'm not the manager. The manager's protected those leaders. I think he's actually said, "I believe in them. They're my guys. I want them to do well." Yet you go on a football pitch and they do those things, Scott, like we saw there. And you know, getting yourself booked in that moment is 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 unacceptable. But I think also that first pass in the first six minutes that you chip the ball into midfield that is gross negligence. Yeah, and when we saw it happen, we were like. He, he, where is the brain? Mm. What's happened? And you saw the whole team just go <sighs> deflated, make one mistake, and then it impacts you for 90 minutes. So I, I don't know. I don't like Eric Ten Hag was stood there again, Scott. You could see him, he's opposite us, and he just was like, What what is this lot doing? Like, why is it like this? How do I how do I stop the bleeding? Because let's be honest, when United are like that, you can't stop the bleeding. You lose. And it doesn't matter if it's Bournemouth or Bayern Munich, you lose that game. I think, Scott, as well, there is that complacency. They they turn up, they get out of bed, they go, it's Bournemouth today. Yeah. And they just they just go through the motions because they think, well, we just beat this lot. Go and play Bayern Munich, Scott. They'll be more motivated because it's Bayern Munich and it's a bigger stage and they're big time Charlies. Anfield, they'll go to Anfield. They might get hammered, but they'll at least maybe have the attitude that they're no, going do to you Anfield. Remember, even remember last season, Rob, when they went to Anfield and they lost seven nil. Yeah, but and played quite well. For they the won first one half. one nil down, like just before half time. Mm. I think it was, wasn't it? Mm. Uh, like it was, a, it was a good goal. But somebody, I think it was first forty the, minutes. The right, the United were good. Off. I can't remember who it was. Yeah. They were good. They, they could have scored really first. Good. They were like, really good first 40 minutes. And then they abdicated. That was it. They, they, yeah, they, and then they're like, oh, no. Like, oh, we lost a goal. Like, now, now let's give up. They were 1-0 down. <laughs> then they ended up being 4-0 down. And then it was like the most worst scoreline you've ever could have imagined. And I think that's the thing with these with this team, Scott, is that they don't have that DNA for self-preservation in games. They mm. don't think, I need to help my teammates. And this is where I talk about the leadership. This is where I talk about the captain. Is that I don't believe on a football pitch, Scott, he helps anyone. I think he helps himself. 
And I don't think he helps anyone else. He's, he thinks about himself. He doesn't think about his teammates. I think Bruno said the other day as well, Scott, in a presser, he said, oh, none of my teammates have a problem with the way I captain the team. I'm sorry. I think a lot of the fans have. I think when we watch it, we want to see someone actually lead. The one person leading this team at the moment, Scott, is the guy you tried to sell to West Ham not that long ago. Harry Maguire is playing like a captain, trying to run through brick walls and stop people. He can't do it on his own. So, I don't know. I, 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 I feel, more than anything, I feel pity for Eric Ten Hag because I don't think there's anything he could do except change the tactics now to do something. Like Bayern Munich and, and Liverpool, Scott, he might think, 4 2 3 one, I've got to do it now. I think that that's my that's my big takeaway at the minute. Yeah. Is I, I think you've you've tried this enough times. We've seen that you can be more pragmatic. Yeah. Just be more pragmatic yeah. for a little while and start yeah. winning some games one nil. You know, I, I that that's that, that's the big thing for me. I'm not, not saying he's gonna go beat Bayern and Liverpool one nil. I'm not saying that at all. But just like solidify things, tighten it up. The the style thing it was only a few weeks ago where people are saying he's got no style. He's got no style. Like watch the difference in the football now compared yeah, to yeah. a few weeks ago. Like very different. It's, it's incredibly different. It's yeah. more back to how it was at the start of the season. And then he's, you know, it, there's been games where he's had to go, oh, okay, we, we better, we better keep a clean sheet here because things are getting a bit, a little bit uh, problematic. And you look back at last season and how boring United really were to watch, mm. but they just had that underlying energy level to kind of close things down and yeah. like keep things tight. This kind of thing. I think he needs to go back to that, to be honest. I agree. And and I think the thing is being swashbuckling is all well and good, but if swashbuckling gets you like beaten by Bournemouth at home and maybe a lot of the other bad results that we said, like 12 defeats, I think at this point in the campaign across all, all competitions, it's unacceptable. Like you don't want to lose that many in a, in a season sometimes, you know, you don't want to lose 12. Um, but th this team, as I said, they when when they hemorrhage, they really hemorrhage, like they just cannot stop it. And, and I don't understand why, because it really is as simple, Scott, as slowing things down, putting your foot on the ball and making in-game decisions that... That it's not about Eric Ten Hag on the touchline in that moment. It is about the midfielders. It's about the defenders. It's about the forward line, about how you link together and how you help each other. I, I think Amrabat on the day against Bournemouth was totally fine. But again, people target him because he's an easy target. Yeah, I think the other midfielders are culpable. They really are. They don't help him. They don't sit in. They don't get the ball out. They don't play normal football. It's all, it's all like so erratic and mad that when you're watching it, right in front of you in the freezing cold or in the rain you're looking at it and you're thinking that's not normal like you're not doing normal things just be normal please so I, I think Eric Ten Hag as I said before if he'd had any hair he would be pulling it all out because I know that's what how I was and how do you fix it, Scott? Like, if, if if someone like Bruno is your main midfielder, what what do you well, do? Rob, you did it's, it's so incredibly ironic. He doesn't have to drop him on Sunday, and you That's... might get some kind of midfield balance in there that we've been asking for because he's not there. I know, I know. Again, you can we'll probably can carry stadium. one of them, maybe. Yeah, you can carry McTominay. At times, you can. But the reason why Ollie played a double pivot all the time was because he had Bruno Fernandes. <laughs> completely you know <laughs> and, and and that is never talked about is it and that's exactly why he used to play 4-2-3-1 double pivot McFred behind a guy that basically wants to just run around wherever he wants to go and that's okay if it works but if you lose games because of it it's not okay is it so I I just said that like when we walked out again at the stadium Scott people that was again one of the things people were like well Bruno can't play at Anfield now let's see what this midfield does because now you're forced to do something a little bit different, aren't you? You've got no choice. The captain is suspended. Um, the best game this season, Scott, from midfield was in the League Cup against Crystal Palace at home. And that was Bruno and Rashford didn't play in those games. And that was the most that was the most intelligent United had looked all season mm -hmm. long. They looked like a proper functional team. Yes, with rotations. Yes, against the Palace team that had rotated. But it looked like what I just called normal football. It's like people doing the normal work. Against Bournemouth, we just saw once again how dysfunctional this lot are. Just to, to touch on Bruno yep. um, being suspended. <coughs> so there's a, there's a, <laughs> there's a section uh, which is going around British press uh, mm. since Sunday night. Yes. Mike Keegan. Uh, talking about Jim Ratcliffe's book on the success of Ineos. Mm-hmm. 
Introducing Grit, Rigor, and Humor, The Ineos Story. That's what the book is called. Yeah. Ratcliffe talks of his travels and remembers a trip around the... This is an extract, I think. Ratcliffe talks of his travels and remembers a trip around the Pacific during which he felt the ground tremble every time a Cook Islander smashed into another in a local rugby match, adding that one player was carted off in the back of a pickup with a broken leg. And then it says, Ratcliffe, a long, lifelong United fan, then pointedly notes out that it was a far cry from Bruno Fernandes clutching his untouched face in the Liverpool debacle recently. I mean, it's the, same, it's the same fixture as last season, right? Isn't it? Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's the same game. 7-0 uh, in March mm -hmm. last year, or this, this year. So, <laughs> Rob, I mean, like, we, we've talked about the, like, not having the right tools, not maybe being made of the right materials to yep. be captain. I mean, like, personally, I, I and I know you said this as well, Rob, the, the booking is a disgrace like yeah. it's it's actually it's it's not befitting of somebody you want to lead your team like because i think to me and to most people who are watching that and again we can we can't get in the guy's mind he's been to anfield and lost seven nil he's been to anfield and lost four nil he probably doesn't want to go back and that for me if you're wearing the captain's armband come on i i think that 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 sums it up really, and I think if Sir Jim Ratcliffe is looking at Bruno Fernandes behaving like that at, in that game last season, and is taking ownership of the club, what what does that say? <laughs> How much time has he got? You know, I think that comment from Ratcliffe is is how fans feel. Like I think I honestly feel this is that as much as Bruno gets a lot of protection on social media from his stands or pl or fans that just want to love Bruno because he's Bruno. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I I feel that, again, that's how the stadium feels. You feel that buzz. Do you know what I mean? Like with that yellow card, Scott, people were, were, were upset with that. And, and it was they were probably more upset than with the goals going in. Like when the goals went in, you almost like laugh because you're like, United are so pathetic. But that yellow card, Scott, in terms of captaincy, um, you know, I saw Roy Keane get booked and sent off a million times for Man United, like I really did. But you never, you never kind of came away from it thinking that he'd done it deliberately to be suspended for the next match, which was a huge match at Anfield in a critical season for the manager. Like we talk about supporting the manager, don't we? Is that Eric, the biggest thing he could have done for Eric Tanag in that moment is just get off the pitch? Yeah, and he knew it. So I, I'm going to say it. I think it was a deliberate yellow card because it was one of those cards that people get before Christmas. I would say, you know, like yeah, oh, one suspension yeah. away before Christmas. We actually saw it in the game the other day in two or three other games with players that didn't need to get, get booked and little stupid trips. And you're like, what are you doing? You're clearly trying to get yourself booked here. This is not I, good. I've seen some criticism for Ten Hag not taking him off. <coughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I'm not. I'm not having that. But like, the responsibility is with Bruno. The responsibility is with Bruno Fernandes. He, he, he can't. It was needless. Yeah, you're trying to win games. You're trying to play risk and reward. You're trying to empower your best players. And he's already done it with Rashford, right? He's taken Rashford out the firing line. Rashford will come back in. There's no doubt about it. Rashford's had a couple of games out, but Marcus was ill for this game. Like that's why he was sat on the bench. He was he, he'd reported ill the day before, so it was easy call then not to bring him back in for Bournemouth. Bruno Fernandes is your is your man. He's your guy. You need him to pull all the strings. Now, that's a lot of pressure on one player, of course, but he has to do the other work as well, and he has to lead. And I'm going to say it, Scott, out loud, because it's time to say it. I think that you are now looking at a, a, a universe post Bruno Fernandes already. I think you're looking to the future with Jim Radcliffe and Ineos and whatever it is, whether that's with uh, this manager or not, whether Ten Hag keeps his job or not. And I think it's already showing that you fundamentally need a different style of leadership on the pitch, a different style of midfield. And that has to come through the transfer market. Rob, I don't think I don't think there's many people, many, many people in this team who actually would survive an entire no. clear out. I mean, I'd look at maybe Martinez, uh, potentially Luke Shaw, yeah. Colby, Garnacho, yeah. Hoyland, really. That, I mean, I mean that's any more? 
No, there, there isn't anymore. But I do also think that again, there's the, the fandom kind of opinion of it is just that you have to work with what you've got with what you've got, and I agree with that. And I think a new manager, it's the same thing. Yeah, you know, yeah. I don't subscribe to clear outs. You can get rid of large chunks of players. Um, you can bring in large chunks of players in. You can start that process. There's no doubt Ten Hag has tried to do that, affected by injuries and whatever you want to call it as well. But I think when you look at this. You should be able to rely on some of these guys to do some of the basics. You should. You should be able to rely on your captain to not get himself booked at this moment. You should be able to say to your captain, well, you have played number eight a lot in your career. Can you just do the normal stuff? Like, just don't wander out of position and run around in the wrong areas because that's what he does. Scott McTominay, you could say, Scott, is limited. So you would go... Well, I don't really want you to do that. So maybe we can't do that. Maybe I shouldn't be picking him, even though he scores the goals. I think that's more question, uh, uh, questionable. I don't think you should be bringing Bruno Fernandes off in those moments because Bruno's the guy you need to be able to keep keep it all together, to glue it all together. So th- there's a lot wrong, Scott, and we know that there is. We know that there's, there's tons wrong, but you have to look at individuals now and break down what their, their impact is to United long-term because I think if you have a captain that doesn't lead you, you have to change that captain. Now, last year, that was the criticism of Harry Maguire. That he wasn't playing games. He couldn't lead you on the pitch. There's no way Bruno Fernandes is doing that. He is not leading this team on the football pitch. I think he's selfish. I think he's inward. He looks at his own game and what he does, his contribution. And he thinks that that's leading by example, I think. And, you know, what is that team thinking when he got himself booked? in the final minutes. What is his teammates actually thinking about that, Scott? There'll be a lot of them really angry about that because they'll be like, Bruno, you sold us down the river before we get to Anfield. Let's uh, let's move on from Bruno. I think there's going to be... Make Kobe problem. captain. Make Kobe captain. Kobe Manu, new captain. Uh, Garnacho vice captain. <laughs> uh, Hannibal, the point, the point stands, captain. though. I mean, uh, <laughs> if, if it was a, like one moment or one action... I think where you can summarize hmm. the mentality, <clears throat> the weak mentality of this team is that it's that moment, it's that fucking yeah. Do you know what because... it's got? It's dishonest. Yeah, it's a dishonest way to be a professional footballer. You're pretending to be a professional footballer and that you care, and you cannot say you care about them. You do that in that moment. That's what really hits me hard. Give me an honest pro that puts in an honest day's work and loses over a player that is just a charlatan. I don't want to see it every... I want to see that kind of outwardness in, in that honesty in our professional footballers on a football pitch. <clears throat> Sorry right. for the oh. rant, people. Sorry, people watching us. They'll be like, oh, Rob's on a Bruno one again. But uh, uh, this is how it is in the stadium. I'm just... I'm kind of trying to convey how we all felt in that final whistle and what the talk was around then. He's not the only one. but He's yeah. not the only one. It's just that he's... He's the captain. He's captain. Anyway, uh, so what you would you want to go next, Rob? Should we should we look ahead to Bayern? Is it worth it? Bayern. Um, <laughs> Harry Kane. Uh, I mean, the, the 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 fundamental truth here is United could have the best performance in the world and still go into the Europa League. So you, you know, or yeah. go out completely. They they could play brilliant, they could beat Bayern 5-0 and still go out of the Champions League. Yeah. You know, so it, it don't go expecting. Uh, that United are gonna, you know, do anything. They they need to see a reaction. We need to see a reaction. I'm sure we do, but we need to we need to see a reaction at Anfield as well. The problem is we need to see a reaction all the time. Yeah, that's the thing. That's the thing. And Ten Hag, Ten Hag says this a lot. And you know, um, for those who are criticizing Ten Hag, all he's asking, he said before the Bournemouth game, put the same effort in, hmm. make the same correct decisions you made in our wins because every team in the league can kill you. Every yeah. every team. And he's, he's looking at examples of uh, Villa beating City and L- Luton won, Liverpool won, yeah. and all this kind of... You know, it's not just United. It's just United are really crap at managing it. Yeah. That's what uh, the league table shows us, doesn't it? The league uh-huh. table shows this year that that the reason why Man United are still six points behind Man City rather than three, which was what it was the other day, 
is because you you haven't all these teams haven't managed the situations where you're trying to rotate your squads, win games, and play your best football. I think with United, <clears throat> that cycle's gone on for years. That's been the problem. Is that we are constantly like it's like a boxing match where like you you have one good round of boxing, yeah, and the next round you get spacked on the chin and you're on the floor, bang down, and then you have to get up again and do it all over again. Funny thing is, Scott, with Bayern Munich and with uh, the trip to Anfield, is that I don't actually think it's about winning those games now. It's actually about showing that you can do it, do the job. And if you lose those games, OK, it's, that's that's where you are. But don't get hammered in those games because there is now that feeling that you might lose those games really badly. Like I don't want to put a, a down on everything. And if you then lose those two games, Scott, in a really embarrassing manner, might mean the end of Eric Ten Hag. You know, this is the manager of the month, people. The bar, you know, the Premier League manager of the month yeah, is a, one game. It's, it's one game away. Score. It's farcical, isn't it? So it's like I think this is where you, again I, I think to be able to get those results out of these players, I think he needs credit for that. But I think also at the same time, if you lo- if you lose against Bayern Munich at Old Trafford, Scott, and that place goes flat as a pancake, because that's what it was at Bournemouth towards the end of the game. Well, it was empty. You, you felt, yeah, but you felt the people that stayed to the end and I stayed to the end. doesn't mean I'm better than anyone else, but I stayed to the very end. The oxygen had been removed from the stadium. And when that happens, it's quite rare. Even when you lose a game, sometimes United will lose. The fans will keep singing because they, they they do. They'll keep singing. And yeah, there were boos. You can't can't say they shouldn't be boos after something like that. But I think when you look at the this Bayern Munich game, Harry Kane's going to be turning up. Harry Kane's going to be going back in England, playing quite well for this team by Munich. I want to win the Champions League, and I could have signed for Man United, you know. You know, they did ask me, but didn't go there. Let's watch what I do. And it's it's worrying, isn't it? And two or three people said to me on the Bournemouth game, they went, Oh, I wish we'd signed Harry Kane. He'd be he'd be the same. But we did like 10 shows on like, like why you should sign Harry Kane, shouldn't we? And and I'd, I'd be happy with Harry Kane as your leader at the moment, as your as your captain and your guy running the team, than, than what we've got. So he's going to come with Bayern Munich and they're going to just come and tr- want to play normal football, Scott. That's what they are, normal football team. And it is a little bit concerning because you can lose that game, but if you lose it really badly, like horrifically, get carved up, I don't know where we go from there. I'm sure we'll be doing a post-match show saying that's that. Yeah, you you don't really you don't have any confidence that the mentality of the the, the squad mm. will be able to avoid anything but a trouncing. Yeah, if if they lose again, uh, they could they could get a trouncing anyway. But like as we just said earlier in the show, like United played pretty well for 40 minutes at Anfield last season and lost seven yeah. 0 and, yeah. and and that like. <laughs> That sums it up, doesn't it? And I think we're, we're still seeing that. We're still seeing those problems. Uh, the, the manager has to. I know he's stubborn, but like the, the manager has to has to find a way to put to, yeah. to stop the bleeding for me. I, I think it's. I'm I'm very very willing to wait uh, until the personnel is different for yeah. riskier style to be played because I, I know I've seen it. Like, yeah, I I look at Tottenham fans and I, they. They are looking at no, Pap Sar played yesterday, right? Yeah. Hoiberg dropped out. When Hoiberg plays, they're like, I can't believe I don't want this guy to ever play for us again. And I, he's in yeah. McTominay. Yeah, yeah totally. Goals. It's this the same thing. It's the same thing. Yeah. You got Basuma and Saar in there, who are not, you know, not the big greatest uh, in terms of profile, like the most famous footballers in the world or anything like that. But they're yeah. good. They're good players. You know. They can they can do everything, and United just don't have those really. Uh, and maybe the, maybe there are some in there, but I think Eric Ten Hag really has to just look at them and think, right? I've just got to. We've got to do the basics. We've got to do the foundations. We've got to stop conceding three, four goals a game because it's just it's too much. And that could that those three, four goals could turn into seven, eight against the next two teams you're going to be playing. And then I'll ask the question: Can United even afford to sack the manager? Who's going to sack the manager? I mean, what, John Murta, who could not have a job in six weeks? Is he going to sack the manager? No. Is Sir Jim Ratcliffe going to sack the manager? Well, he's technically not in there yet. Is he allowed to? I don't know. Is it wise for somebody like Sir Jim Ratcliffe 
to sack the manager, get his own manager in, and then have that manager fail because he's got the same problems that Eric Ten Hag has with the squad. You know, there's. I, I don't think for me, I've seen this question asked a, a lot over the last few days. What do you do next after Eric Ten Hag? What do you do? And I'm seeing people say, oh, well, it's not my job to answer that. There's there's people who run the football club that should be. The next manager is going to have to deal with the same issues that Eric Ten Hag is dealing with. Completely. And and I, and I you think... Might, you might get an uplift for six months, but it doesn't fix it. Yeah. And, and I think, look, if we can assume to an extent that, say, Ineos were already pulling some of the strings behind the scenes at Manchester United, you know, like we know that Dave Brailsford was at Old Trafford the other day talking to the talking to the board, probably telling a few people what they would like to see happen in the next few weeks before any announcement is made. Um, I don't think that there will be a huge desire to sack Eric Ten Hag. I don't think Ineos on day one are thinking, yeah, the manager's the problem here. They'll be looking at the infrastructure and they'll be looking at that recruitment and what's been going on with the players. There's no doubt that the issues in 10 years have been having players that can't do things that you want them to do. I think that's probably fair, you know, over a period of time. But I do think this is that if they come into the football club and Man United are say on a bad run, like say you do get hammered by by Munich, you do get hammered by Liverpool, it then becomes a lot easier for an incoming administration to go, well, that is a that's something that that clearly isn't working today, just this function. The manager's not getting the most out of these players. We can't sell all the players tomorrow. So we have to change something. It will be the manager. But I do think that Eric Ten Hag kind of fits an Ineos type manager. Like I think he will be part of the committee and they'll work with him and he's dead they want that type of coach I don't think they want a Zidane I don't think they want glamour I don't think they want to be a Galactico project they understand I think that it will take time to build it up like they have done in all their other projects but I, I get why fans are, are on that now a lot of fans are like you know Eric Ten Hag can't manage anything but we are seeing the same issues aren't we uh, I think Jim Ratcliffe will We'll have maybe one or two or three or four candidates that he's interested in outside of Manchester United. Like that's good due diligence of any business to be able to have options and have a succession plan. Um, but I don't think it's the right thing to do now. Like I don't think that's that that solves it. I don't think you get that new manager bounce. Like United are not in, rele in relegation candidates, Scott. Like you don't have to save the season. <laughs> you don't have to. You have to find ways to get results and. United can do that to an extent, but then they are still dysfunctional. As long as you've still got the same players at your football club, you will get the same kind of performances. So you must have a process through January and into next summer of being able to swap in and those in and out. And that's why I said a minute ago that that's why I think you've got to look at a kind of post Bruno Fernandes Manchester United because what he does doesn't work for you. It worked for Ole Gunnar Solskjaer for two years and then it didn't work. And it wasn't Bruno's fault. It was It was the other players as well. But I think that's where this manager will be now. I think he'll be looking at it and going, I need to get some of these players out the door, but I still need to love them and support them and tell the world that they're my players. But I'm going to be telling Jim Ratcliffe that I need two new midfielders and that I need another striker to help Hoyland and I need another centre-back because Varane's now on permanent holiday. So there are those things there that, that I don't think change massively with just a new coach. And look at Pochettino at Chelsea, Scott. Like, Pochettino is a good coach and is finding it hard to get a song out of that Chelsea team because it's fractured and they've spent hundreds of millions, hundreds and hundreds of millions, and they can't get a song out of that team yet. But I think we all feel that in time, he will. But do you know what? They might sack him. Mm -hmm. We just don't know. It might get to the point where they just sack him beforehand, and that won't be his fault. The same way it probably wasn't Graham Potter's fault when he got sacked there. So I think that's where United are. And I don't want United to make that mistake. I don't want United to just cut the manager's throat. Unless you really have got another coach that you go, this is our guy. But you, like, we're going to stick with this guy. But Robbie, even if they do have somebody else, like even right now or like next Monday after United lose 8-0 to Liverpool or in January, as soon as the announcement gets confirmed that they're taking over, I know that they're doing their, their due diligence and this kind of thing behind the club as uh, behind the scenes at the club while they complete the takeover. Yes. Is it even the most savviest thing to do to just change it straight away? Like to me, to me, like you're potentially just falling into the same trap. The, the other owners have for years. You just look at it, let it exist for what it is. Take your time to analyze the situation and make your decisions.
Like we, to me, yeah. that that's what I think should do should be done. And whether whether Ten Hag is the right person or not, as long as somebody with an ounce of sense in their in their brain is making that decision, you know, I'm, I'm very I've, I've defended Ten Hag, and I will still continue to defend him because the people who are making the decision to fire a manager when they have a bad result or give a manager a contract after he's had a good run of matches and because the fans exactly. feel like you know, <laughs> that's not how you run a football club is it scott do you remember us having this conversation at the yes. end of last season we won the league cup and there were fans and people saying to us give eric ten hag a new contract and what was i saying i was going no don't give him a new contract yet like wait you have to let things play out you have to, it's so easy to get excited when you win and cry when you lose but like you just said there about Ineos coming in and, and what their purpose will be is that I don't think that they'll come in on day one and think, oh, do you know what? United are where they are because of Eric Ten Hag. I honestly do not believe that. I don't think anyone with any football savvy up here who watches Manchester United week after week after week after week thinks that. I really don't believe that. No investigation into Manchester United will tell you that the biggest issue at Man United is Eric Ten Hag. That is just false. It's not real. But... I do think that they'll look at the setup, and I think I think the first thing they would have identified is that a big problem was Richard Arnold, right on day one. I think you go in and you go, this is the guy at the top of the pyramid, and everything trickles down, and everything that's trickled down stinks. So we have to change that first point. Guess what? Richard Arnold's gone. He's no, he's no longer going to be at Manchester United. He's not going to be part of this project. So he's already, you know, they've already named an interim for that. So we know that there'll be structure at the top changing in the institution. But Eric Ten Hag is not near that top. And I think this is where fans may be misinterpreted. He is somewhere down the pyramid. You know, he's part of the solution long term, but he's not part of the immediate issue. It's all from upstairs. <clears throat> and then if you've got a coach, Scott, that maybe fits your... I don't know your philosophy, like, let's go down that route. Like, say a Deserby. Let's let's use Deserby. You like what he's done at Brighton, and you go, we're going to be Brighton 2.0, but on a bigger scale. We're Man United, and we're going to recruit, like, Derby over a year or two, and we want a coach that plays mad, expansive football, and that's our philosophy. That's how we want to play. Then, okay, go get Deserby. But do not think with these players that it gets fixed in six months. Because it doesn't. You'll be still losing games with the Zerbi or whoever's name is above the door on a week-to-week -week basis because it's the dressing room. You have to solve those issues within the dressing room about what you put out there every week. So I think that's what Ineos will do on day one. They'll go, right, we need a transfer kitty. We need recruitment. We need to change the top dogs here. We're the top dogs now. We're going to change all of that. We need to empower Eric Ten Hag, give him six months and say, we want to watch you manage this team. Show us what you need. Tell us mm -hmm. what you need. That's what good management does. It empowers people. It doesn't cut people's throats. You've got to find a way. If you're treading water, Scott, and you're swimming, don't drown. That's the most important thing in the first bit. Don't try and swim faster. Just stop for a minute and breathe. Tread water and find your way away from where you are. So I think that's that's Manchester United in a nutshell at the moment. Is that half the time with these football matches, it feels like we're drowning and that the solutions there don't exist at Manchester United today. I don't think there's anything to do with Eric Ten Hag as far as that's concerned. Yeah, just just a final note. You mentioned him earlier in the show, Rob, about Dan mm -hmm. Ashworth. We we at Night in Min, we posted on Friday, I believe. Um, yeah interest from sir dave brailsford who is undertaking an inquiry currently like behind yes. the scenes at united about what the hell's going on we've already seen richard arnold has gone <clears throat> um obviously there's a number of targets but we we pretty much sol solidly know that when this is confirmed sir jim ratcliffe will take 25 percent with it comes the control of the football structure. Wonder why they they want the football structure, by the way. Oh, yeah. because the the current incumbents of it have made an absolute hash of it for yeah. 10, 10 years plus. And then you're looking at Jean Claude Jean Claude Blanc, who <coughs> formerly of PSG, formerly of Juventus, safe pair of hands, knows what he's doing according to his uh, his past records and his his past work elsewhere as CEO potentially. And then you're looking at. Um, 
Dave Brailsford, obviously, I think, who will come in and maybe oversee the thing day to day. Because Sir Jim Ratcliffe, I don't know if you know this, but he can't spend any more than I think it's about three months in the UK a year because he lives mm. in Monaco. <laughs> so Dave Brailsford might be the one who is doing a lot of the work for him <clears throat> in terms of the day to day. Mm-hmm. Jean Claude Blanc. And then they're looking at, and Dave Brailsford is looking at people like. Dan Ashworth, sporting director at Newcastle. This is what we put in our report at 90 Min the other day. Not to say this is a guarantee that Dan Ashworth will be convinced to go to Manchester United. I'm not saying that in the slightest. There's no guarantee that this happens. It's just somebody can want something to happen. And if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. You might have to find somebody else. But the the way that it's looking at the minute is, uh, you know, look at Paul Mitchell as well. And he does fit into this. He does yeah. fit into this uh, potential puzzle. But I think United want, or the new owners want to find a structure above the manager, which is what we're talking about here. A structure above the manager, which will allow the manager to do the job that he needs to be done in the style he wants to do it. Whether that's Ten Hag or not. Yeah, you just talked about Blanc there as well. I, I, Blanc already works for Ineos. And Ineos's way of approaching this is, as we've talked about before, like the Red Bull approach. And that is kind of you bring people in-house. And then you're strengthening your institution over time. Like, you know, it won't be just about Manchester United. They'll be thinking about Ineos and sporting projects and, and taking someone like Ashworth and, and and assimilating him, keeping him in their structure forevermore. Like, that's how that's how you do it. You build up the relationship together. We we see what he's doing at Newcastle Ashworth and it's, it's quite impressive. I think we're all... I think you think where Newcastle are now in the Champions League and in their position in the Premier League and where they were before he came in. And the one thing you can credit them is that they haven't rushed it and spent like tons and tons of money with this unlimited purse that they have with their Saudi owners. And it's come from a proper football project, hasn't it? So you have to give them that kind of credit. I think United, I think Ineos will look at that and say, right, we want a little bit of that. We want a bit, we want to be able to build from the top downwards and support people and be able to find ways to to become a better football club I, I think the whole thing is Scott is that someone like Ashworth comes in and brings leadership you know he brings in someone that can actually hold a manager's hand and say right we know what we're doing technically here like we know this player that you want and yeah we like him well do you know what you want that player but we're not going to give you everything you want because we don't think that player fits our, our project that's not what we want. You know, that's what Arsenal have done with, with Arteta. Arteta's gone, I like this player, I like this player, I hate that player, I hate that player. All right, we'll get rid of those because you don't like them. But we're going to cherry pick these ones that you want. You want Declan Rice? Yeah, we'll pay £100 million for him. That's all right. We'll work that way. And United need to be a little bit more like that, don't they? That's where we need to go now. When we talk about replacing the midfield, Scott, that's now crucial, isn't it? Because that is going to cost you a lot of money, first and foremost. If you went and got a Basuma or someone like that, like Tottenham did, you'd be in a better position than you are now, aren't you? Because you haven't got a player like that. But you need to go and find them. And then you need to look at the Kobe Manus and the Garnachos and maybe even the Hannibals to an extent and say, right, this is the core of our youth. How do we add more youth to that? But first teamers who are 21, 22, 23 year olds, and we're not relying on 28, 29, 30 year olds that clearly get a big contract at United and then don't do it, you know, then decide that they're off and that they've, they've had enough. They've had a year or two of the money in their pocket. So um, that's a big call. You know, that's where Ineos, I think, will be going now. And I think that's also why, Scott, we've not had a real big announcement yet, a big fanfare announcement by Jim Radcliffe saying he's taken that part of the club over because they've had to work behind the scenes quite diligently to find ways to move forward. And guess what the first thing they did? Richard Arnold, gone. That was like the first move of, on the chessboard. That's what I think we're going to be talking about, Scott, in the weeks ahead here. I don't know we'll be talking too much about managers. But then again, if results completely crash for whatever reason, there's always that risk. And the manager's job is absolutely at risk. We do know that as well. Same which old, is sad. Same which old, is sad. Same yeah. old story. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, right. So United played Bayern on Tuesday. I'm delighted to say I'll be going up there in the cold. Hopefully I'm not it rain. <laughs> raining the other day, wasn't it, Robert? Yeah, oh, horrible, yeah. torrential rain. Like, do you know when it was pouring with rain that day? We were like, once upon a time, when teams came to Old Trafford and it poured with rain, we always used to joke, "Our teams don't like that coming to Manchester in the pouring rain." Um, uh, but that game, we were like, "Our, our lot team doesn't like that. it." Yeah. Our, our lot will come out and go, "Oh, it's raining. I don't know if I can pass a ball today." Because even when it's dry and sunny and we've got a beautiful football pitch, we still can't keep the football. So it doesn't fill you with confidence, does it? 
yeah, we'll be back after United potentially are eliminated from the Champions League or go into the Europa League or go through in the Champions League. We'll see uh, what happens in the buying game. Not not much confidence around, but maybe we'll see a reaction. And then uh, we'll obviously touch base again before United's trip to Anfield, which is just sounding like an absolute doll at the minute, isn't it? So, uh, yeah. Be, being knocked out of Champions League may not be the worst thing for Manchester United in the current predicament, Scott. May not be. because Because what's the point in flogging a You're dead not going to win the Champions League. You're not going to win, win the Europa League. You're not you know? going to win. The, you're not going to win the Champions League. Even if you get in, it will be some kind of minor miracle. Like if you get through, it will be like crazy. When you think about when you look at the the table as it stands, but you, you need some of these competitions out your way so you can build again, so you can do the normal stuff. And and I think actually Newcastle have found this now playing that whole Sunday Wednesday cycle that goes round and round and round, Scott really tough like it, it hurts your players and United have got no consistency they can't do it so maybe remove that factor at the moment who wants to play wet nights on Thursday night in the Europa League I think that's probably where United are more likely to end up if they carry on in the competition yep subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and watches on YouTube the promise and the Man United podcast like the video subscribe leave a comment etc 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 and follow us on social media at double underscore Scott Saunders at underscore Rob underscore B on X and YouTube and at TPL MUFC. I'll actually be doing Instagram stories. If you want to see my reaction uh, to Man United crashing out of the Champions League, just go to Night Him In underscore football on Instagram because I'll be uh, I'll be there uh, probably talking you through the night. I know everyone will be watching it anyway, but um, if you want to see my, uh, my face like this, uh, if you're listening on an audio platform, I was just making a really, really not. How would you describe that face, Rob? You uh, look like you look like Bruno Fernandez when he got booked with four minutes to go. Yeah. <laughs> you looked a bit bit pained. <laughs> yes. Uh, right. Let's live through this week then. Okay. Great. Thanks for listening, everyone. Uh, see you soon for another Promised Land pod. Cheers to Rob and from Scott. See you soon. Until next time. Goodbye.